Okay, welcome back. Let's talk about some philosophers. Okay, so let's see. Let's do the screen share here. So this idea of using logic to figure out the world. On the one hand, we have, you know, some developments in art. On the other hand, what about just, you know, trying to figure out the world in general? Um, and that's kind of the role of philosophers. Uh, like I said, a philosopher means someone who is a lover of wisdom. So philosophers were, you know, wise people or people who were trying to be wise, people who are trying to have more knowledge about the world. Um, and uh, basically, you know, a lot of times this looks like science, but it also looks like, you know, studying history, studying things like that. Basically, a lot of different fields of knowledge that we consider separate fields of knowledge were rolled into this idea of philosophy back in the day. And so this is going to be a big influence on uh, Greek society. Now, it's a question of how much this was just something the upper class cared about, how much did it ever like affect sort of more the more lower classes in Greece. Uh, but it's worth thinking about um, that it might have had some effects too. And certainly the ideas that the philosophers came up with would go on to be really influential later on. Um, and so we have to talk about them and we want to talk about them as part of our society in a way too. Okay, so with the philosophers of Greece, you can basically divide them up into two time periods or two groups. You have the philosophers before Socrates and you have the philosophers after and including Socrates. Um, so we tend to call these the pre-Socratic philosophers and for lack of a better word, the Socratic philosophers. Um, so Socratic philosophy has its own set of ideas and concerns, but before Socrates, there was philosophy that focused on a different set of concerns. And we'll get into so Socrates. We'll meet him and learn his philosophy. But the pre-Socratic philosophers, um, you know, if the Greek sculptor, if the Greek sculptor's question was, what, how does the body move? How do we understand the human body? The pre-Socratic philosopher's question was, where did the world come from? How does it work? What is it made of? How does the universe work? So in a lot of ways, these guys were a lot more like what we'd call, what we consider scientists in a way. Uh, science was originally called natural philosophy, philosophy about nature, philosophy about things that grow and move and the universe itself. That's what the first philosophy was all about in ancient Greece. And that's a pretty cool subject to dive into. Basically, the first thing that people tried to figure out as philosophers, as these sort of proto-scientists was, where did the world come from? And they had a lot of different answers to those questions. One philosopher, uh, Thales, and um, this is, um, these philosophers usually come from the archaic period. Um, Thales suggested that originally the world was all water, and then the water sort of transformed into different types of substances that earth and um, air were just transformations of this original substance, water, um, and that the creatures that lived in the water, they had evolved out of creatures um, that uh, they evolved from creatures that lived in the water into creatures that lived on land, including human beings. So he didn't have a lot of the details right, but we think on some level that part is basically correct, that creatures that lived in the water evolved into creatures that lived on land. Uh, so that's pretty cool. He had some right guesses there. He didn't really have any strong evidence for this. He was just uh, putting forth this idea um, that um, that this is where things might have come from. And I think it's striking how he wanted everything to be one unified substance originally. Today we know this is kind of true. There are different types of matter, but they all come from the same thing originally. Um, he was looking for a similar kind of idea. Um, and so he said, well, it's all water. And these are just different forms of water originally and different creatures that came out of the water, which is not quite right, but um, he had a, a, you know, he was going in a good direction there. And I should mention with a lot of these pre-Socratics, we don't have their writings in a way we would like. We mostly have quotations of them by other authors. We kind of have to reconstruct their philosophy just from these bits and pieces, which are known as fragments. Uh, but Thales gave us a really good starting point to try and investigate the world, give us a theory of where everything came from. As time goes on, things get a little bit more abstract. A guy named Anaximander uh, said, yeah, everything was one substance, but it wasn't water. It was kind of undefined. It was something that was neither hot nor cold, no, nor wet nor dry. And the Greeks like to classify these pair of opposites. Um, these philosophers were the ones who gave us the four elements as we know them, um, earth, water, fire, and air. Uh, and, you know, 
earth is um, earth is wet, but fire and air are dry, and water is wet. Um, and then you know, earth is heavy, uh, but water is light. Uh, things like that. Um, he would try to classify things according to these uh, dif different elemental patterns. Um, so um, he was trying to understand the world through these pairs of opposites, and he had something similar to Thales, but more abstract. From there, the philosophers get into trying to understand just what is the nature of existence. We have a guy uh, called Heraclitus. Uh, you might have heard uh, that you can't step in the same river twice. Well, it sounds just like a cute saying, but for him, it was actually a big part of his philosophy. You know, you step in um, the, the, the river uh, twice, it's actually literally a different river. It's made out of different water molecules, we would say, different parts of the water. Um, there is no material in that river that was there before, as far as we can tell, right? Um, so that was part, a big part of Heraclitus's philosophy is that everything is flowing, everything is changing. The world is just this constant state of change and never stays the same way for long. And Heraclitus is sometimes called the crying philosopher uh, because he thought that was quite sad. You know, he said, oh, everything's decaying and going away. It's very sad. Um, so that was his, part of his outlook on the world. In contrast, we have a Democritus who is known as the laughing philosopher. And Democritus... Um, his philosophy was um, that everything is made out of these tiny pieces that are smaller than everything else. And these pieces are basically the smallest unit of the world. And these different kinds of things uh, made out of different, these different kinds of pieces are what give different substances their qualities. So there's different elements. And these tiny pieces are known as atoms, which is um, a Greek word meaning can't be cut. So the smallest uncuttable part um, that's the atom. And guess what? You know, today we say, hey, he was basically right on the money. And when people discovered like these tiny parts of matter in real life that give these different elements their qualities, um, they said they named them after his idea um, of these um, of these atoms. Even though it's not quite right, you can still find smaller parts inside atoms, but atoms are basically the smallest part that give things their qualities as we understand them, their characteristics. Um, so he was pretty right there. And why is he the laughing philosopher? Well, because he was, he's what's called a materialist, uh, which is basically uh, the idea that there's nothing in the world um, that cannot be described according to the idea of matter, of stuff. He didn't really believe in what we'd call supernatural things, spirit and souls and things like that. He said, hey, it's all matter. Um, now, he might believe in the gods. He might believe that the gods are out there somewhere. But the gods, if they exist, according to him, aren't really relevant to people's lives. Uh, they just kind of do their own thing. Um, and people shouldn't worry about the gods um, because what's important is matter. And why is he the laughing philosopher? Because he didn't believe in an afterlife. And he thought, you know, that meant there was no punishment waiting for you after death. Uh, like some of Greek religion suggested that the evildoers could be punished in Hades and that Hades is just kind of a grim place to be in in general. Um, and so he was laughing because he said, hey, it's all okay. You know, we don't have to, um, we, we can, um, our existence only lasts as long as we do. Um, so we don't have to worry about anything like that. And uh, we don't have to worry about the gods. So that made him very optimistic, which is interesting because you could definitely interpret that negatively too, but he interpreted that very positively. Another really great uh, pre-Socratic philosopher is Pythagoras. And Pythagoras, you've heard of the Pythagorean theorem. Well, this guy was very into mathematics, but he was also into a lot of other stuff. Um, basically, he was kind of a mystic. He believed that numbers were kind of the underlying foundational principle of the universe. So instead of water, it's all numbers. And because of this, his followers really didn't like irrational numbers very much. They really wanted to believe that numbers could, all, that everything in the universe could be expressed as a ratio of two numbers, every measurement you could take. Um, so he wasn't too cool on, on um, decimals. He really only liked uh, fractions that could be written as this in ratio to that. Um, and he believed in this kind of mysticism of geometric shapes 
uh, that governed the universe. It was all made out of these sort of sacred shapes. And he had this whole mystical philosophy. So on one level, he's like a mathematician, right? He gives us, um, you know, our familiar um, Pythagorean theorem. But on another level, um, he uh, was actually kind of more like a mystic or a, even a cult leader. Uh, his followers were pretty considered pretty eccentric and pretty strange. Um, he and his followers believed in a, rich, a, a, a reincarnation principle. So when you die, you're born again as an animal um, or another human being. And so um, the Pythagoreans, because of this, they were all vegetarians. They refused to eat um, animals because uh, they thought, you know, there's a good chance that it might be uh, your loved ones or your cousins uh, reincarnated again. So you don't want to do that to them. So don't eat meat. Um, now, they also applied this to beans, which was um, uh, because they thought that beans looked kind of like little fetuses. Little, so they thought, you know, maybe people reincarnate as beans as well. Um, so they, they did not eat beans and they did not eat um, uh, meat. So I don't know how they got their protein exactly. Um, but there's a story, uh, which is probably not true, but there's a story that um, Pythagoras at the end of his life was running from some soldiers. Um, and um, he uh, was going to run in the direction of a bean patch, but then, you know, he didn't want to crush the poor baby bean. So he was scared. Um, and so he didn't go in the bean patch and he got caught and killed. That's the story anyway. Uh, but it kind of shows how people would joke about this. But yeah, they had this whole religion worked out about reincarnation. And like the idea was that people would go to Hades, but they would drink from the water of forgetfulness. And then their souls would go to a new lifetime. Uh, so pretty cool uh, and an interesting thing to look into more um, if you're interested. And then the last of, I guess you could kind of call him a philosopher, uh, but in another way, he's the first doctor. The last of the sort of pre-Socratic thinkers I want to talk about is Hippocrates. And he's a little bit late. He's more contemporary with Socrates, but he was basically the first scholar of medicine. So he tried to understand the workings of human, the human body and give advice for how to help people take care of themselves. He had a lot of thoughts, like a lot of Greeks did, on the influence of like climate on one's health and the food you ate and your diet. So he's probably the first one uh, to, rep to uh, recommend having a specific diet. Um, and of course, he's best known for, by doctors today for the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so the Hippocratic Oath says, first do no harm, which is very important, right? You don't want to make the, the patient worse. So above all, the doctor should swear to not um, cause the um, patient uh, any more harm than they're already suffering. And then after that, you can make it better. So he had some ideas like this about how to be a good a medic, a good healer, as the Greeks would have put it. Um, and so people still quote his Hippocratic Oath today. And he also did some work on anatomy that helped people figure out how the body worked. Okay, so that's the pre-Socratic philosophers. From this point on, we get into, you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers are all very concerned about what we would call science. But the post-Socratic philosophers are much more concerned about society. They're concerned about human beings in, turn, in a social sense, not in an anatomy sense. They're concerned with, you know, how do we make society work? Now, the Greeks had done a fair bit of thinking on this already. We had the institution of democracy, which some people liked and some people didn't. Um, and even outside of democracies, we had a lot of law writing and a lot of, you know, trying to figure out how to engineer their oligarchies and aristocracies to have good laws. Um, so it was inevitable that people would really start trying to figure out human society in a more detailed way. And eventually we enter into philosophers who are trying to figure this out um, in more depth. So we could ask the question then, what are the problems in human life? How do we try and solve those problems? What kind of society would we build in order to solve those problems? And one guy who did an awful lot of thinking about these questions was Socrates. So Socrates, he didn't really care where the world came from, but he cared a lot about humanity. For him, the big topics were goodness and justice. How do people become good? How do people act in a better way towards other human beings? How do you encourage people to have justice? How do you make a society that's going to have justice and goodness in every part? He would ask these questions, and boy, did he love asking questions. 
So Socrates, he was an Athenian. He didn't leave Athens a whole lot. In fact, some stories say that he never left Athens his whole life. Um, but he was very fond of the city. And originally he was a stonemason. He was working, you know, making statues. Um, but on his, uh, with his free time, he would wander around the city and he would go bother people, especially important influential people. And he would ask them questions. And he would ask them questions about goodness and justice. And pretty soon he built up a following of people who really liked what he had to say. Um, but Socrates always said, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to promote my point of view. I'm just asking you questions. Of course, um, what this ended up being in practice is that he could, in fact, uh, ask a lot of questions and then be kind of leading questions to lead you towards an answer. So as much as he said he was just trying to figure things out and he didn't have any ideas of his own, he kind of had ideas of his own. So this method of asking questions to lead people to an answer is today known as the Socratic method. Um, and sometimes people use it in very sophisticated settings, but I can also see how back in the time it might have been a little bit annoying. If you've ever had a kid who keeps asking, but why, but why, but why, and refuses to take um, a final answer, that was basically Socrates. Um, he was said to be not a very good looking guy. A lot of the statues kind of depict him as kind of balding and kind of pudgy and having a big nose. Um, that's what the stories about him say he was like. Um, but he, you know, I think people like this idea that he had an ugly face, but a beautiful mind. Um, and for Socrates, it was really important that people didn't know the ants didn't know what they actually believed. He was asking them the questions to get them to think about um, what they believed. Um, and uh, the story of Socrates is that he thought that he was ignorant. He didn't know anything. And then one day he went to the Oracle and the Oracle told him, the wisest person in Athens is you, Socrates, or possibly someone else, one of his followers went to the Oracle and said, Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. And when Socrates uh, heard this, he thought, this doesn't make any sense. I'm an idiot. I'm a dummy um, because I know how much I don't know. But he went around and he asked, started talking to people and he realized that everybody else in the city um, the city thought that they knew so much. And he was the only one who was willing to admit when he was wrong, when he was ignorant. And so that was what made him actually wise, was to know that he didn't know anything. Um, and the temple outside um, uh, the Oracle of Delphi uh, says, has the message on it, know yourself. And the way Socrates interpreted this was, know what you believe and know when you're, and be willing to admit when you're wrong. So that's the kind of attitude he um, wanted to uh, promote in Athens. And the way he would do this, he knew he was often being very annoying, but he, um, he sort of described himself as a horsefly, a horsefly that was gonna bite the horse and wake it up. And the horse was the people in Athens. So he was trying to wake people up and have them understand some more. So what did he actually wanna say? Uh, it's kind of hard to say because we only really know him through his followers who wrote after he died. Um, and this is one of those cases where we kind of have to reconstruct his philosophy, uh, but know that we might not be getting the true picture of him. Uh, some people feel like he might have not actually been all that great um, and his philosophers just made him look better than he was. Other people say his, philo his uh, sort of followers distorted what he was actually trying to say. And so we lost the original Socrates. Um, but what happened to Socrates? Well, he was actually put to death. He was killed by the democracy. And this is one reason, you know, someone like Thucydides, although he doesn't mention him, might have been down on democracy, is because the democracy voted and said, um, you know, uh, he was corrupting the youth. And he was kind of an atheist, quote, quote. It's not really atheist like our modern concept, but he didn't pay the proper respect to the Athenian gods. So um, he was put on trial, uh, he lost the trial, and he was sentenced to death by poison, a kind of poison known as the hemlock, which is a kind of plant. And at his trial, he was asked to speak at his own defense. And he actually said, no, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Um, they asked him to suggest a sentence uh, for him. Uh, and he said, actually, you should give me the, the, you should allow me to eat free in the city, which is what they would do for an Olympic victor. Um, and so he seemed to be just kind of messing with them. 
But he continued on to say that he was not afraid to die. He didn't know what death was. He doesn't, didn't know whether it was good or bad, but he felt like it was useless to be afraid of it. And he only helped, sought to help people understand the truth. And if his trial helped other people understand the truth, then he wasn't afraid to die. And he wasn't going to leave town and try to escape because he was loyal to the city of Athens. So that's a pretty cool story. And in some ways, Socrates is one of history's first martyrs to the truth. Um, but uh, it depends on how great you think he was, whether he was good or bad, you know, how much did he actually know the truth? Okay, so I think I'm going to stop the video there, and we'll pick up with the followers of Socrates, and then we'll finish with looking at some Athenian uh, playwrights and the tradition of theater in Athens.